All right, I'm gonna get started. This is, let's actually get this in a better mode. There we go. All right. All right, so we're gonna get started today. Thank you for joining. Thank you for your time. This is such a great way. If you have a lot of things to do, you can just listen to the audio. You don't necessarily need to look um, at the visuals while I chat about how I went from a 204 to a 128 half marathon. And I think the best part about all of this is how you can do that too. All right. So I'm going to give a little bit of an intro first. Um, I am a runner. I am a running coach. I'm a podcast host. Um, and I'm also a dog mom to an awesome black lab. Her name is Kenzie and I'm a runner just like you. So I started running, um, post-collegically in 2005 for about five years. And I really focused in on running consistently, but at the time I didn't really focus on, I need to be consistent with running. It was just something that I was doing most days after work. And one of the reasons I got into running was to relieve the stress from my eight to five job at the time, which was in financial services marketing. And I did that for 14 years before uh, starting Elevate Your Running and becoming um, a running coach in the summer of 2020 also known as the pandemic. <laughs> um, so for five years, I was leaning into a lot of like fast running 5k, 10k races. Um, I was running a lot of my stuff, a lot of my runs way too fast. I think we can all kind of like say, yep, that's me too. I think we've all been there. or Maybe we're in that season right now. I took a break from 2010 through 2017. And I think that's important to note that like life happened. I had moved to Colorado, which is where I live now. I live in Boulder, Colorado. And I was just excited to explore Colorado and hike. I was still moving. I was still exercising, but it was different. Um, I was taking like hit classes and I would maybe run you know, one or two days a week, but it could have been maybe two, three miles at a time, right? Nothing compared to what I'm doing right now. So um, let's fast forward to 2017. I ended up signing up for a local 5k and I placed third overall, which was exciting. And it was something that I thought, well, okay, it's something I love. It's something I missed. I think I'm ready to get, dive back into it. So I dived into running and that's really where my journey begins. Um, I'm heading into my sixth marathon. I've been running consistently since 2017. I started partnering with a running coach in 2019. Um, so I've been using, uh, running coaches, um, partnering with them over the last four years. And I know that that's been a huge game changer, more specifically in the last like 18 months um, when I switched coaches and it made a huge, huge, huge difference. Um, I'm a five time Boston qualifying uh, athlete and I ran the Boston marathon twice, but I started out with my first half marathon in 2010 and I ran a 204. And I was so jazzed by that. That's like a 930 pace. I was so jazzed by it. And I thought like, you know, I definitely had some IT band problems. I was running in Denver. I had just moved to the Mile High City uh, the year before. And I was just really excited that I finished. And that's really after that race, I had hurt my IT band actually in the race, which I don't advise running through pain in a race, but um, you know, being that young and that new to the sport, I didn't know any better. And I was just pushing through. It ended up sidelining me for about six months. And I think that was probably one of the reasons why I fell out of um, in sync with running and why I took seven years off. But I also know that everything happens for a reason. And yes, I am a big believer in that. And, um, and it got me to where I am today, which is a really exciting place to be. All right. So this is what my half marathon training plan looked like in 2017. So this is fast forward 2010. So in 2010, I ran a 204 half marathon. I took seven years off. 
fast forward to 2017, my sister and I got to participate in the Seaways Half Marathon. And if you are a newer runner, I would say since the pandemic, you might not have heard of this race, um, but it was uh, hosted by Lululemon in Vancouver, BC. It was the half marathon to run. Um, it was a lottery system. It was exclusive in a way of like, they only had a certain number of spots and it was all on a random selection, which was really great. And my sister and I got in, in both 2017 and 2018. We are very, very lucky. It was so much fun. They did it up. The course was fun. A lot of cheering. They had yoga. They had a concert after the race. Um, they had a ton of free swag that we got each year. It was so much fun. It was a very hilly course too. But I was also training in Denver and running at sea level. So at this point in my journey, I was running a few days a week. I was participating in Orange Theory, which I really loved. And then Soul Cycle or Cycle Bar, if you know what that is, um, it's like a cycling class or about 45 or 50 minutes. So really good cross training, but I wasn't doing anything um, aside from maybe 12 or 15 minutes of strength training that was in like my Orange Theory class. My longest long run was maybe 10 miles. And I think you know, take a second to think about your first half marathon or your second, third, fourth training cycle. You could be that runner and that's okay. We've all been there. It's like, you have this idea of like, yeah, if I can run 10 miles, if I can run 13.1. So that's where I was in my journey. Um, I ran all my miles way too fast and I was like basically self-coached, i.e. I read Runner's World magazine and, you know, I wasn't really actually coaching myself. I was just going out there and just like doing whatever I wanted to do on the given day. So I ended up running a 151.16. It was an 830 average. Um, and I think that was due to, I mean, definitely running at altitude, going down to sea level helps for sure. So um, but I was also doing a lot of cross training and cycle bar, I think was definitely a good contribution to that time. My sister was also doing that with me and she crushed it and ran a sub, uh, two hour half. All right. So this is us in 2018 where one whole year later, I spent time for 12 months doing all the things that I love to do, which is movement. I was still taking orange theory classes. I think my longer, long like my long runs got longer. I know I didn't go over 13 miles, but they were more in line with like 12 miles. Like, Hey, if I can run 12 miles in my long run, I can definitely run 13.1 on race day. I ran more mileage overall, just year over year, which is a huge value add for anyone who's looking to get faster. The more miles you run, the better, the bigger aerobic foundation you build, which is essentially the engine in your body. And as a coach, I always uh, say to my athletes now, like, what kind of engine do you want? Do you want that like Ferrari or Tesla engine, depending on what side you fall there with a gasoline or EV, or do you want to have something that is not as fast, not as strong, something that takes more effort to get through that finish line. Right. Um, so running more mileage overall helped. Um, and I've been very, very lucky to be a high mileage runner and staying healthy. So that's been a huge piece that I'm just, you know, basically just lucky to be able to do. Um, I still wasn't working with a coach at this point. I knew the course in the route, which I think is a huge value add when you're going into a race and you're trying to do better. If it's a race that you've already run before, or maybe it's close to home, or it's a route that you run on your regular training runs, that's going to make a huge difference because your body knows the course, your mind knows the course, you have the muscle memory. So I was able to shave off 12 minutes off of my half, half marathon in a full year. I wasn't paying attention to fueling and hydration or recovery or any of those like needle movers, or I call them like the one percenters in training, but I was using jelly belly, jelly beans. If you know what I'm talking about, like the sports beans. And I think I was eating like one pack for every 
uh, race, like every like 13.1 miles, like maybe I carry two packs. Um, but that's like two, one pack is a hundred calories. So let's say I took two packs, 200 calories for racing 13.1 miles. Um, and you're expending so many more calories than that. So I'm going to circle back to that later on, but I ran a 139.09 in 2018. And that's when the light bulb went off. And I thought if I can take 12 minutes off of my half marathon over the course of a year of doing, you know, a lot of, you know, I was running a little bit more cross training, I'm going to hand this over to someone who knows what they're doing, who is certified in this and see what I can actually do. And that's when I got the idea to run my first marathon. (laughs) So I ended up running my first marathon in 2019. I ran the California international marathon. So my next half marathon after the 139 was in Moab, Utah, 4,000 feet. So lower than Denver, lower than Colorado. And Um, so I had that benefit there. It was rolling Hills. It was awesome, but it was also a tune up to my first marathon. Now, if you've run a marathon, you know what that first training cycle feels like. It's not that fun, right? Am I right? I think it's a huge wake up call to athletes because it's a very different training cycle than the half marathon. You're running more. That long run really takes a toll on the lower body. You really have to be consistent in getting in some really good quality mileage. You can get away with running eight, 10 miles in your long run to run a half marathon, but with the marathon training, you really need to be at 16 and no less to be uh, considered, um, successful. So I went into my first marathon saying I can run 139 half. I really want to go in and be my first marathon. So I hired a coach so I could run my first marathon, run it smart, run it well, BQ, and just have someone lay everything out for me. I think that was actually the biggest thing that I wanted. I wanted a plan. I wanted someone to tell me what to do. And I'm that type a athlete. I'm just going to do it. So Um, I went into this race as a recovery week, no taper. I remember feeling exhausted and I just wanted the race to be over. I mean, how many times have, has that happened to you? Right. I started playing around with more fueling on runs, but I was still under fueling for sure. Um, and this was my first half marathon with a coach. And I actually ran, if you notice the time slower than the time the year before. And I thought, what the heck? but there's a lot of different factors that go into each race. And that's one of my points for today is that every race is such a nice snapshot of where you are today and where you are tomorrow or where you were yesterday is going to be a totally different snapshot. What you hope to happen is that you are feeling strong, you're feeling successful, and you have everything kind of fall into place correctly on race day. And sometimes that happens and sometimes it doesn't happen. And that's okay. But I ran a 140.16 and I'm like, well, this was also on like 4,000 feet of elevation gain. It was slightly hilly, which worked really well in my favor for running CIM, which is also it's net downhill, but it is like short and snappy hills. So I thought, great. My sister and I ran this one together as well. It was a lot of fun. She absolutely crushed it. I think it was actually her last half marathon, which is really sad, but she crushed it. And we had a fun weekend in Utah, which is always, you know, that's always nice too. Okay. So I ran CIM marathon December of 19. So it was about eight weeks after I ran the Moab half and I was running six days a week. I was kind of like topping out. I think my highest mileage uh, was about 62 miles for um, that first marathon training cycle, which builds a really strong aerobic engine, which really helps run strong and run fast. So I decided five weeks after my first marathon that I would run a half marathon in Houston. And 
the way the coaching system worked at the time with the coach I was partnered with is that it was a package thing. So I bought three months of coaching and she trained me through CIM. If you're wondering if I Boston qualified, I did, which was exciting. And I ran a 325 and it all was like working, right? I thought, okay, like I am getting stronger. I'm getting faster, but I was really tired of running after CIM. And that was actually a mantra that I was using in the last bit of the race. I said to myself, you never have to run again if you just finish this race. So um, I took a lot of time off between the marathon and this half marathon that you're seeing here. It was five weeks apart. I would not recommend as a coach that you race a half so soon after running a marathon because it's a huge, the marathon takes a huge toll on your body and you really need more time to recover. But I wasn't working with a coach at the time. I had stopped running. I was maybe, I definitely took two full weeks off and then I sprinkled in about eight or nine runs over the course of the next three weeks to run this half marathon. Now, my friend had invited me. She was the marketing director at the Houston Marathon. And um, I looked like such a baby in that photo. It was in 2020, uh, right before the pandemic. And, you know, my friend invited me, she gave me a bib and I thought, what the heck, I'm going to do it. So Houston is actually a great, it's a great place to race because if you can time it right in the winter, they can have really great weather. It can be um, cool, sunny, um, but just really nice weather. And Houston is flat as a pancake, which for a lot of us provides really strong running. I know not everyone loves flat courses. Um, some people really like downhill or rolling hill, but for me personally, a flat course is where I'm going to run my strongest. I can metronome miles and just click off paces and it's a great place to be. So it's something I'd love for you to think about as an athlete of like, where do you race well and what type of course, and then really lean into those races when it comes to picking out your races. Um, so this was really a breakthrough half marathon. Um, five weeks after CIM, I know that it came from running at sea level, running a flat half, which was my very first flat half marathon. My first four before that were all hilly and it came off of marathon training and having and running a ton of easy miles, a lot of miles, and just like actually getting super consistent with running and during that, that prep, I did some strength training, but I cut out all the extra classes and the hit stuff. Um, and then we entered the pandemic. <laughs> so, um, Utah actually had a pandemic or uh, Utah actually had some races during the pandemic. So in 2021, this was a race that I was able to drive to. And, um, and I had partnered with a new coach at this point and I was running six days a week. It was really my outlet with dealing with the pandemic, you know, gyms and classes weren't really available. So it's really like doing as much strength training as I could at my house and then running outside. So this is the cycle where I really leaned into taking my easy days easy and my recovery days even easier and then running my workouts and my long runs as they were written for me by my coach. And I think that's a huge game changer. Earlier, I had said that I was running all of my miles hard, which left me running not that often, not that frequent. I couldn't be consistent with it. And as my PT jokes with me now, like he never sees me. And when I am seeing him now, it's for a tune up like Hey, I just need to get my hip stretched out or get like a little dry needling to clear up a little something. And in these days, I was definitely seeing, especially in that like Vancouver, Moab, CIM cycle over those three years, I was seeing my sports doctor at least twice a month. CIM prep, it was twice a week because I was that hurt. Like I was just niggles left and right. So I really embrace that 80, 20 running where the majority of my days are just so easy. It's like you're jogging. That's basically how I describe it to athletes. Now you're just going out for a jog. You should feel like you can continue to go and continue to run when your time is up or your miles are over. Um, and then on your workout days and your long runs, you like hit 
the pace is written. So that's going to be a huge piece to running faster when you race. Um, and I introduced recovery into my training. So sleep is the number one recovery tool. It's going to be a huge factor in what you do and how you perform and how your body recovers nutrition and hydration are next up. If you recover well, bef- like eat well before, during, and after workouts and long runs, that's going to set you up for success. And if you're that morning runner, definitely getting something in your body before going out for even just an easier recovery, long, easier uh, recovery run is going to make a huge difference. And you're going to feel so much better. Um, and I could talk about that on a whole other like webinar. So maybe that's a topic for another time. I added better fueling. I was taking in more gels and I was consuming more when I was running. And I worked with a sports dietitian during the pandemic, um, because I actually was running, I wasn't running well at all during the pandemic. Um, so after Houston through, I would say about eight months, I was running terribly. I was, everything felt really hard, even running my easy and recovery days were around 10, 10, 15 minute mile pace, um, which was a little bit slower than they could have been during that time. And it felt hard. And I was just miserable. And a lot of it was the pandemic. And a lot of it was another thing going on in my life. And as you know, or maybe you don't know that like running is stressful. And when you have other things in your life that are also stressful, um, your body doesn't know the difference between the two. So it's just going to, at some point, build up and tip over. And that's kind of what happened to me. So I worked with a sports dietitian to really work on how to fuel my running because I started to dream bigger than like, you know, I was going to Boston at some point. (laughs) who knows when, because we're still in a pandemic. And I thought I really need to get my fueling figured out and I need to, that's like my next step. I really need to get that figured out. So I just feel better on my runs. So fueling was a huge piece to it. And so, uh, during the spring of 2021, I ran a 132 58, which was, um, you know, I guess three, two minutes, two minutes faster than the race before. So I'm ticking down. Right. And I'd always had this dream of running sub 90. I think once I ran 139, that's when I started to dream really big. Cause I thought, okay, I'm getting close to sub 90. That's really my goal. And I really want to do it. So I went back to Houston the next year. It was a tune up for my third marathon. So I'd run the Boston marathon that fall in 2021 And then I went into the Mesa marathon four months later, highly don't recommend doing that. (laughs) Um, I did get a fabulous half marathon out of it. So I went into this as a tune up four weeks out from Mesa, which is also too close. And, um, and I ended up running a 13101. I was running five days a week through the winter. I was running through a lot of snow. I still wasn't doing any indoor running. So everything had to be outside. It was more time on feet focus than mileage. Um, again, this was a recovery week. I didn't have a taper. I just went into it, which now apparently is like a great way for me to race. Um, it was a good day for a great day. The weather was perfect. It was high 30s, slight sun. You can see I have arm sleeves on shorts, tank, like awesome. I was taking resistance classes twice a week. So that's Pilates. So I think that started to really help to build some strength. And then I began stacking training cycles. So at this point I had been training, I had CIM, I took a break. And then I went into the Southern Utah half, which went into Boston marathon training and immediately went into Houston half training, which then went into the Mesa marathon that I ran the next month. So I was stacking my training cycles, right? My highest weekly volume was reached during that Boston prep the fall before I ran one week at 67 miles. And that played a big part in this race. I ran extremely well. My coach didn't think I had this time in me. I wanted to go sub 90. 
Um, so that was what I kind of had in my mind going into this. He thought I'd fall a little bit closer to like 134. Um, but I ran a 131.01. And it was one of those days too where I just felt really good. And that's, you know, when you feel really good on race day, it's like a little bit easier to produce something fabulous, right? So I thought, okay, I am 62 seconds off of my sub 90. How hard is this going to be? Well, guess what? It's hard. <laughs> so I went into the Mesa marathon and then I thought, okay, I'm going back to the half marathon distance. So that summer I went into my, um, my next sub 90 attempt. Maybe it was my first, maybe it was my second. Um, I guess it kind of depends on, on, uh, what you think about the last race and where my coach thought I was versus where I thought I was. So, um, I went into the grandma's half marathon, which is actually called something else. Um, but I love calling it the grandma's half marathon. Sorry. I think it's like the Gary something Bajork half marathon. So it's on the same day as the grandma's it's in Duluth, Minnesota. It's rolling, um, hills, but it's net downhill. Um, this was one of the first training cycles, I guess, since the Southern Utah half where I trained just specifically for the half marathon distance, it is a fast course, but it was a warmer day in Duluth and there was a long travel day the day before. So I ended up traveling to Minnesota the day before, which at my age now I am a master runner. It's not something I like to do because I do like to give my body an extra day to be there. So it doesn't feel so junky and like just um, heavy on race day. So I flat, I felt flat during the race, which can happen. And, you know, I ran a one thirty two thirty five, which a lot of people were like, you know, on a bad day, if you're running that, that's like really a good day. Right. And I can't argue with that, but I was still sad that I didn't progress forward and that I'd moved back. And I think it's a great example of like, training isn't linear. Racing isn't linear. You're going to have these like progressions and then some races where you fall back, right. Where you're like, Oh, I just wasn't as fast today. And that's okay. It happens. I actually should have used a better picture. I have a picture where I'm holding, it's like a selfie with the metal. You can see that I was crying because I was sad, but that's okay. Um, all right. So then I thought I'm going back to Houston. Now in this period of time, it was 2022, I had changed coaches. So I went back to the original coach that I worked with for CIM. And so I've had two coaches over the last four and a half, almost, I guess, five years. And no, I guess just four years. And I'm definitely with this coach for as long as she'll have me. <laughs> She's fabulous. So, um, so we went into Houston thinking that's where I race well. Let's get that sub 90. I was coming off of a Chicago marathon build. I had run my highest mileage ever. I PR the, the, the marathon. So anytime you do that, you can typically PR like the shorter distances. So I went in to the Houston half. And as you can see from my time, I did not PR. I didn't even, I, I ran a full minute slower than when I was there the year before. And a lot of that was due to, um, a warm and humid morning. So I was coming from Colorado training and we had a terrible winter. So it was a lot of treadmill running and a lot of like 10, 15 degree runs. And, and Houston ended up being 60 degrees when we started the race and it was 90% humidity. And I was already sweating at the start line, which is a very bad place to be. Specifically, if you are a warmer runner, I am, my heart rate just skyrockets and it's like really, really tough to hit paces. So, um, the paces just didn't translate. So I was like, all right, and there we go. Cut to the Indy half marathon. So that was, uh, last month I am in the process of running CIM next month. So this was a tune-up going into CIM and it was a breakthrough race. So it was a recovery week, no taper. I'm been running my highest volume yet. Um, running consistently 74 ish miles over the last like five, six weeks, something like that. So I spent the summer working on speed. 
So that's where a lot of the 128 came from. I needed to work on my gauges, my speed gauges, right? So I needed to work on that one mile, that 5K, that 10K. I had the half marathon and the marathon dialed in, but you really need to have that extra speed if you really want to go the distance in that race that you're looking for, specifically the half marathon. So I spent June, July, August working on 200s, 300s, 400s, 800s, 1Ks. Um, so that's anywhere between half a lap on a track up to a, two and a half laps on the track. And my coach also asked me to start running during the day and get um, just used to and heat acclimate a little bit better. It helped a little bit in the summer, but I have to tell you, it definitely helped when the temperatures cooled off. It made a huge difference. And I just shot up my fitness just shot across the room. It was incredible. So it running in the heat's really hard for me because like I said earlier, I'm like a warmer runner. So if that's you, I would suggest maybe doing this, obviously, you know, talk to a doctor, don't do anything that's going to like harm you, but I would go out around 10, 11 AM and run in the summer heat. Um, and really what it came down to is that I got outside of my comfort zone. I got outside of my comfort zone in terms of the summer speed and working that top end speed, which is really difficult if you've only been training for a half or a marathon. And then I was running in the heat all summer, most of the summer. I also really paid attention to my nutrition. So I started taking supplements as women, as female runners, specifically at altitude. There's a very specific, like the iron and the ferritin specifically usually are too low, which means you're, you're not going to have the energy that you need to train, recover and race. So getting that fully dialed in, if you look closely, you can tell that I have a jowl on my lip, which is awesome, which is why I use this picture. Um, I fueled the best for this run. I took in, um, three gels during the race at the 5k, 10k, 15k. I ate an incredible breakfast that had like 600 calories in it. I took a gel right before, but this is all something that I did as part of my training. So it was something that I trained with. So I knew it was going to work on race day. What you like, how you show up in training is how you show up on race day. And you also want to test out everything to make sure you don't want to try anything new on race day. I'd also incorporated heavy strength. I went back to Boston earlier th this year and my coach really wanted me to pick up heavier weights in the gym so I could run those hills a little bit stronger. So we dialed in, we did one day of heavy gym strength, which was about 60 minutes, like 50 to 60 minutes. And then I was still doing two days of Pilates or resistance training along with running six or seven days a week. So all in all, each training cycle and race is a great way to learn what works, what doesn't work for you and then continue to grow as an athlete. So what I like to do is after every training cycle, I'll write out, what did I like? What didn't I like? What didn't work? What worked? And then pick something that like didn't work. So for me, it's like, I need to dial in my nutrition. I need to heat acclimate. I need to pick up. I need to be stronger and picking one thing and adding it to the next training cycle. For athletes across like the world or for anyone listening to this, it could be being consistent, feeling before your workouts, getting to bed on time. I say that in quotes on time, like a certain number of nights a week, right? Because it's like not really realistic to do it every single night, especially if you're a parent and you have kids. What happens when you stack these training cycles? And let me preface that you should have nice rest and recovery between each training cycle. I did that for the majority of my training cycles. I didn't appropriately do it between a few and my performance a thousand percent suffered because of it. You show up flat in training, you show up flat on race day. It's not a great place to be. 
taking a step forward each day and just knowing that what you're doing and the intentionality around that day, maybe taking your easy days, easy, your harder days, hard stacking that strength training on a workout day is going to be huge fueling your body, the strength piece to it, the visualization piece to it, which was actually the other part that I really added in over the last three months was also visualizing um, and visualizing like what I want to create on the course, how I want to run, how I want to feel not specific. Some, I did get a little more dialed in towards closer to the race with specific pacing, but it was more about the feeling. That's a big piece to it. Knowing and understanding that training isn't linear. So you're going to have cycles where you're not as strong and you're not as fast and that's okay. It could be for a variety of different reasons, but if you continue to show up and you continue to show that you can, you know, be consistent and you can get the training in, then you will make progress. It's just a matter of when, like when I ran in 2018, I did not think it was going to take me until the fall of 2023 to take nine minutes off to get that sub 90. I did not. I thought I could do it in like a year, but you have to know that it's a marathon and not a sprint, right? And it's something that will take time and everyone's just going to be different. Um, getting outside of your comfort zone is going to be the fastest way to see improvements, but doing it in a thoughtful, strategic way. So you stay healthy, you stay happy, and you're still motivated to get out and run. And I'm a big believer. It's like time's going to pass anyway. So we might as well get out there, do the thing that we love to do, be consistent with it, and then see what happens. So if you're just getting started, you might be asking yourself, like, where's a great place to begin? And I love this photo because it's of my Denver team. We raced a 5k actually this summer in Denver. And we were talking about it at practice this week because we were like, oh my gosh, like it was such a tough day for all of us because it was so hot, but we had so much fun. We were definitely popping with our like pops of pink, which is one of my like parts of coaching. It's my branding. I love it. I think it's very happy and, and fun and how much stronger we all ran this fall, which was really cool to see. Um, so if you're just getting started with training the elevate your running, uh, downloadable training plans are a great place to start. I have beginner and inter intermediate plans. So it could be that you're in a base phase, especially right now in between like fall and spring, let's work on that base. It's all about that base to get consistent, to get habits dialed in and to really build your engine. Do you want that Ferrari Tesla engine, or do you want something that's not as strong, right? There's also plans for the 5k, 5k, 10k half marathon distance. Ooh, it's my favorite. And then marathon distance, and you can save 20% with code elevate 20 through this Sunday, 11, 12. And that's a great place to start. It's a PDF. You get a bunch of other downloadable guides, which are super helpful. If you're just getting into running or maybe it's a season where you don't want to work with a coach and you just want to follow a plan and see where you are. All plans are written based in, um, based in chunks of time. So you'll have a range of time as well as perceived effort with an effort chart. So you know where that goes. Awesome. So Q and a time, I appreciate you so much for being here, for listening and doing all the things. Thanks for listening. And I hope to see you soon.